time now for Ask the Surgeon, brought to you by Everett Bone and Joint. Everett Bone and Joint, the best choice to get you back in the game. Learn more at everettboneandjoint.com. All right, welcome back to Integrated Rehabilitation Group Health Matters. Maury Eskenazi along with Shannon O'Kelly, and this is the Ask the Surgeon segment brought to you by Everett Bone and Joint. That's right, Maury. Tonight we have Dr. Clay Wertheimer, orthopedic physician, with us from Everett Bone and Joint right here in downtown Everett. How are you doing, Clay? I'm doing great, Shannon. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about hip pathology, more uh, importantly, the hip labral tear. But before we start talking about the labral tear, uh, set us up. Uh, talk about the hip joint, the anatomy of the hip joint. Okay. Uh, the hip joint is a ball and socket. Uh, so the ball is on the beginning of your thigh bone and the socket is in your pelvis. And it's a pretty deep socket and a pretty round, almost completely spherical ball, which gives you a great range of motion. The other part of the anatomy of the ball and socket joint that uh, we're beginning to appreciate more and more is surrounding the socket and deepening it is a bumper or rim of gristle cartilage, and that's called the labrum, or that's a Latin word for lip. It forms a lip or bumper all the way around the socket, and um, uh, labral tears are now being recognized more and more as an important source of hip pain in athletes. That's interesting because um, particularly in the professional sports field, we're hearing and seeing more of these athletes. Uh, talk about some of the sports-specific activities, you know, hockey uh, what other sports are you seeing this in? Yeah, we're seeing it in all sports, and uh, part of it is sports-related. But uh, a very famous uh, labral tear is now swinging a big bat for the New York Yankees, uh, Alex Rodriguez. Um, you know, he's a baseball player, and he tore his labrum. And presumably there's uh, a part of it that is actually independent of the sport. It's just how your ball and socket are put together may make you more prone are susceptible to hurting your labrum. Some people um, don't have a completely round ball. There's kind of a bump on it. So as they bring their leg up and bend their hip, that bump actually bangs into the labrum and pushes on it over and over again and can shear it and literally tear the labrum. And we're starting to appreciate that more. But it's relatively new knowledge for us. So just uh, bring everybody up to speed, um, the labrum, again, is not part of the bone. It's actually uh, gristle or, con- what do you call yeah, it? Yeah, it's gristle. It's essentially the same stuff that's in the end of your nose or your earlobe or like what we've uh, talked about on earlier programs, that famous piece of gristle in your knee, the meniscus. It's that same material we call fibrocartilage, and uh, it's really tough stuff. But one of the characteristics about that stuff is it doesn't have a blood supply, so once it gets torn, it can't heal itself like your skin and form a clot and, and uh, you know, meld together and, and, and heal. Once the, that type of uh, material gets torn, it stays torn. And in the joint of that ball and socket, um, the torn labrum can get caught then in between the ball and socket and do further damage or tear more. So, again, the mechanism of injury is, is some kind of... Uh, repetitive trauma, overuse, is there certain activities that you see? Well, certainly, you know, hip flexion, like bending your knee up towards your chest, uh, really puts a lot of stress on that labrum uh, and uh, can drive the edge of the ball into the edge of the socket and and pinch the labrum. Um, So there's uh, that's a big part of it. So certainly athletes that do that a lot, hockey players or goalies, um, soccer players where they are frequently flexing their hip and moving it through a big range of motion, those guys are prone to this type of injury. But again, we think there's also something about just uh, what kind of hip you were born with that may really determine a lot of this. So is this related to the hip flexor, too, or no? Is that something uh, The hip flexor is uh, is different, Maury. It's the hip flexors are the muscles that make your hip bend. And uh, that's kind of, it's a different um, uh, part of the hip anatomy, sort of on the outside of the joint mm-hmm. that um, help the hip bend. Uh, really, the hip flexor is a muscle and then the muscle's insertion on the bone that allows you to uh, bend your hip. But you can strain or even tear uh, that part of the anatomy as well, and that can cause hip pain. And one thing um, it's important to know about when you're uh, looking after folks or when you're suffering from these symptoms 
hip pain characteristically is groin pain. You know, a lot of people point to the outside of their uh, their um, bottom uh, <laughs> and uh, at that bony prominence out there and say, oh, that's my hip. But that's not really your hip. That's a part of your femur that makes your hip, but your hip joint is actually in your groin, hmm. uh, about halfway between that bony prominence and, and the midline is where so you're you don't is. know. I have trouble going, is it, a, is it a one, is it a ten as far as pain goes? I don't know, it's a six. I have no idea. <laughs> well, you know, um, what is it right now? What, what is one? I'm, of, I'm hovering around a five and a half. Because right when we started the show, you <laughs> said you thought you had some hip problems. Yeah, I know. I did. <laughs> I know. You I look know. like you're feeling good. Yeah, I feel like Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm kind of interested to find out from your opinion. And you've been at this a long time. Uh, and, you know, when you first came out of school and started in your practice, were you seeing hip problems like this or just not diagnosing them? Well, you know, there's a famous uh, saying that uh, discovery favors a prepared mind. In other words, you kind of have to know about it to see it. Right. And uh, and uh, the cool thing is that this is an example of how we're getting better and smarter. And uh, MRI, especially magnetic resonance imaging, uh, has allowed us to look inside the body and see stuff that we didn't really know that much about. The labrum, for example, this rim of gristle, we can see on a MRI. And um, so we began to appreciate that, wow, sometimes in these people that are having growing pain and hip pain, the ball and socket joint looks good on an x-ray, the cartilage looks good, but, oh, look at that on that MRI, that, that labrum is torn. This must be, you know, a source of the pain. And then the advent of arthroscopy, um, an instrument like a periscope that we can put about the size of a ballpoint pen now that we can put inside the joint, connected to a camera, connected to a screen in the operating room, where we can look in the joint, look and see the labrum, and even operate on it or fix it, uh, those two things have really allowed us to become aware of and treat these uh, labral problems or hip problems. We're talking to uh, Dr. Clay Wertheimer. This is the all-important, famous Ask Surgeon segment brought to you by Everett Bone and Joint. You're probably driving around in your car going, what's that pain? Well, you tore your labrum. <laughs> and if uh, you have any questions, give us a call at 425-304-1380. So, Clay, just uh, once again, just give us the symptoms again. What would one experience, besides the groin pain, is there anything yeah. else that you would have? There's a couple of characteristic things. One is um, the pain is usually sharp. Uh, it usually comes and goes. Uh, it can often be associated with a feeling of clicking or uh, snapping in the hip. And uh, more your hip flexor can also cause snapping. And, and so it can be, Anytime you know, you're challenged. snapping or clicking, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. I've realized that. Yeah, you don't it helps to, to take that click. big bunch of keys out of your pocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, so those are characteristic uh, symptoms, Shannon: sharp, stabby pain, growing pain uh, that's intermittent, often made worse when you squat down or bend or flex your hip. You know, you bend, you bring your knee towards your chest, um, and uh, and uh, a popping sensation or even sound in the hip joint itself. Is this uh, mostly noted with activity, movement, or would these folks have pain at rest or at night or anything like that? Yeah, that's a great point. It's characteristically with movement. As that ball shifts up in and uh, and essentially either pinches or rams into the labrum, which happens as we bend our hip and flex it up, that's when the pain characteristically occurs. So like going up stairs or, yep. you know. going up stairs, squatting down to weed in the garden or uh, bend down to pick something up. And they're not going to have any instability problems because of the hip joint, that ball is so deep in the socket. Are they going to feel any weakness or instability? They may. They may have a feeling or a sense of giving way. And, you know, I see that quite a bit in athletes and folks that have a joint problem uh, it's, I think, a response to pain. The joint suddenly gets painful, and it sends almost a reflex. Uh, Shuts you know, those the, muscles down. Yeah, the, the muscles shut down, and then the, the leg or knee or hip feels like it wants to give out or give way. So you talked a little about it. If, if one suspects they have hip uh, problems or label tears, uh, your primary diagnostic test is going to be an MRI then? Yeah, an MRI. Well, really an MRI arthrogram. Uh, is what my primary test is. So what is, what is uh, for the folks out there that are driving down the road right now, thinking, can somebody get that? Yeah, 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 maybe someone can call us with a question. <laughs> he's, a doc, he's a doctor and his phone's yeah. ringing. Yeah. We'll just forget about it. Okay, we'll keep yeah, going. It's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, what, is a, what is an arthrogram? Explain yeah. that. 
an arthrogram, arthro means joint, gram means like picture. So it's a way to take a picture of the joint. And uh, it basically what happens is a needle is put into the joint and dye is injected into the joint. And then that dye shows up as contrast uh, uh, during the MRI. The pictures that um, are produced from the MRI uh, have that dye contrasting the structures in the joint. So it's just a way for us to outline and really see uh, some of the structures in the joint, like the labrum, like the cartilage surface, that we may not be able to see if we just stuck your hip uh, in you into the MRI machine. So it provides um, a contrast so the experts that are looking at the MRI can better see the structures that make up the hip. Are you, are you ready for one, more? No. Uh-uh. Okay. No. I'm, not, I'm waiting for my clicking. For okay. to start. Is, there, is there a certain age group you see this more in? I mean, do you to see it in athletes and the younger? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Alex Rodriguez is a classic example, a young athletic person. And what we're actually finding more is we think that this may be um, – an explanation of why hips eventually get arthritis mm-hmm. is because um, folks are born with uh, a bit of a bump on that ball, so the bump keeps banging into the labrum, the labrum tears, it changes the forces in the hip, and then the white pearly stuff, the articular cartilage, begins to shear off and get damaged because the bumper's not working to absorb the shock as well, and that eventually leads to you know arthritis and bone on bone. And uh, we're hoping that maybe by catching this problem earlier and uh, fixing the labrum uh, or uh, actually smoothing off these bumps on on the hips, that it may prevent that progression and may eat slow or even prevent arthritis of the hip. Hmm. So um, what, what uh, treatment options, how do you treat this? Well, the first thing we do is a non-operative treatment because sometimes just avoiding those things that make it bad can uh, take the symptoms away and people can feel fine. So, you know, the squatting and uh, whatever happens um, uh, that drives that knee up to the chest, well, avoid that. And those Modification of activities exactly. or uh, exercise routines, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, stretching may help. Uh, there's no published data or real science, as far as I know, that shows that a tight joint may have more problems, but it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, flexibility uh, exercises, good anti-inflammatory medication, because what happens is the the cartilage gets damaged, the labrum gets damaged. It actually creates an inflammatory response in the joint. The lining of the joint gets irritated, um, and it starts to make more fluid, and that causes the joint to swell, and that hurts. So uh, taking some pills to stop that process um, can help. Um, and sometimes what we do is actually inject a very powerful anti-inflammatory in the joint itself, a cortisone injection. Cortisone, okay. And uh, that's basically like getting a squirt of ibuprofen or aspirin right where you need it. Mm-hmm. It's very safe because the joint is a pretty closed space, whether it's your hip or your knee or your shoulder. It stays there. It doesn't get in your system. Mm-hmm. I think that around. sounds better put like that. <laughs> It's like a shot. Yeah. You know, cortisone just kind of sounds scary, but it's just a shot of ibuprofen <laughs> yeah. in there. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Into your hip. Do it. Yeah, into my hip. <laughs> okay, fine. And if those things don't work, then surgery is a very um, uh, good approach um, if those non-surgical things don't work. And the surgery varies depending on the degree and, and what is torn and, and how badly it's torn and whether the person has this bump on the ball that could be... Uh, uh, impinging, uh, camming, we, we call it, it's almost like a cam mechanism driving the ball into the labrum. And arthroscopic surgery has been a big uh, big progress in, in treating that problem. So what's, what's the recovery time then after an arthroscopic surgery of the hip? You know, it really depends on how much is done. Right. Uh, you know, uh, the arthroscopic surgery could be simply just trim out the torn labrum. It could be actually repair it. So the recovery time varies from six weeks to six months. Great stuff. You know, this is this is kind of my favorite segment. I sit here and catch myself watching it and then realize that I have to You're going to limp out of here tonight, <laughs> Good aren't you? Good stuff, Clay. Thanks, thanks a lot for being Thank with you, us. Hey, it's always a Thank pleasure. You. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Enjoy it. Uh,